Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 839 of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Jeff Walton. It's January 22nd, 2024. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. For those of you who are new to the show, and there are many of you, and I, I, I sometimes don't provide enough context to everything, this is Jeff Walton, and we have Jeff Don because he works with the IRD, which is, in, uh, for many things, it, it gathers information that's important to people like me, and uh, he publishes quite frequently, uh, once a year, the, the statistics for the Episcopal Church or the Methodist Church, and we talk about those once a year. We go over kind of uh, watching a, a train cla- crash in slow motion as the uh, Episcopal Church is self-imploding, and Jeff and I go over his numbers. I'm having Jeff on this week because he attended the uh, Mere Anglicanism in Charleston, South Carolina uh, this week, and I thought we could uh, talk about it. Obviously, you're waiting to hear the real interesting, interesting, intriguing news, but we're going to uh, go up to a wider context and talk about the uh, whole conference itself before we get to that. Uh, first of all, Jeff, welcome to the program. How you doing? Thanks, Kevin. I'm really glad to be here. I'm uh, enjoying a lovely day in the uh, low 60s in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh-huh. Uh, I've got family here, so I'm enjoying visiting for the conference and stayed a few mm-hmm. extra days. So it's uh, okay. it's a nice change of pace from uh, dour, ice cold uh, DC, where I believe it was uh, 15 degrees this morning. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, here we're 70 down in, in Florida. Uh, I know the rest of the nation is still suffering in the cold, but I hear things are going to get better with a uh, a warm weather front coming through. But people didn't tune into Anglican scripted for the weather. They want to know what's going on in the world. So uh, let me give, provide context. Mere Anglicanism is a conference that's uh, held annually in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And younger Kevin uh, of Anglican TV days from probably t- 2010 to 2015, 16, 17, went there uh, annually to record it and broadcast it uh, live over Anglican TV. And it became one of my favorite conferences to go to. Uh, the uh, the who's who was there, uh, the people who wanted to hear uh, great teaching and uh, good academia were there. Trinity uh, would send down some students from the seminary, and uh, there's a dog fight going on where you are. <laughs> yes, there is. Sorry, I picked the back porch at the exact wrong That's time. That's right. No, no, no. We're good. And so, Fortunately, we're on the second uh, story, so the dogs can't get to us. Okay, Let them so sort out their disputes. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Long, long story short, mere Anglicanism is by far one of my the greatest events I would uh, attend annually uh, in all my travels, and I bet you share the same uh, experience. Yeah. Um, so I first had the opportunity to attend mere Anglicanism in 2016. Um, I go to a lot of Anglican conferences, as do you, and each mm-hmm. have something unique in their own way that makes them worthwhile. Mere Anglicanism is my favorite conference, period. It is that good. Um, It often brings theologically rich material to lay people like me who are really craving it. And we get top-notch speakers who are really well-written and are thoughtful in their their fields of expertise. Uh, I still remember... um, the the 2016 conference I attended, uh, which was entitled uh, The Cross and the Crescent Engaging the Challenge of Islam, uh, Mm -hmm. that was not a light topic. And Mm -hmm. uh, it was exceptionally well done. Um, For a a couple different reasons, um, the conference went on hiatus um, for a few years, uh, and that was perpetuated because of COVID tide. Uh, But it resumed uh, last year, and I was one of the first people in line and uh, really thrilled to be back. And I was so grateful for the opportunity to again attend this year. Um, this conference sells out every year. It fills the Charleston Music Hall. And uh, it is an extraordinary combination of teaching and rich worship. Um, the, the choral music at 
St. Philip's Church was, oh. uh, it, it just took me to another level. Um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it just uh, inc- incredible. Um, and uh, the, the people who are who bring this together just do an extraordinary job. So that gives context to what this is. This is not some fly-by-night operation. It is um, really something that draws people from pretty far around to pay a not insignificant registration fee, but it is really worth it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what ha- Tell me about this, the context of uh, this year's conference. Who were the speakers, and what was the topic? Yeah, so uh, it was called "Speaking mm-hmm. the Truth in Love: The Church and the Challenge of the New Morality," okay. and this is looking at some of the issues. There are about eight different speakers. And the, the concepts that are sort of explored are looking at um, how do we speak to one another uh, in truth, but to do so in a way that is loving. And um, that often isn't easy for people to do. Some of us are good at being loving, but we maybe lack the courage of convictions and are conflict averse. Okay. Yeah. Um, other people rush to conflict and are very good at engaging in um, sharp dispute. But at the same time, sometimes uh, that it can be a challenge for them, to, the, the love of that to be heard by the other person. So that's something that they're mindful of. Um, this year we had, um, uh, just rattle off some names really quick, um, Sam Albury, uh, D.A. Carson, um, John Dixon from Wheaton, um, Rebecca McLaughlin, um, Amy Orr Ewing, who has been a previous speaker at Mirror Anglicanism, uh, Vaughn Roberts, uh, who's at, um, he's at uh, St. Abbs Church in Oxford. And by the way, I apologize if I mispronounce some things, um, some of these things I've, I've only read. And um, uh, Calvin Robinson, who many of you are familiar with through his um, substantial uh, online presence and work in the United Kingdom. And uh, Carl Truman, the professor from Grove City, uh, who is... Um, actually did not one, but two Anglican conferences this last weekend. He spoke at Mirror Anglicanism and then flew to Washington, D.C., where nice. he spoke at the Anglican for Life Summit at my home parish, the Falls Church Anglican. Uh, so kudos to him for uh, not getting not just one conference, but two in the same weekend. Well, yeah, that's that's one of the troubles is they overlap sometimes, and uh, this is one of the years that they overlapped. Um, let's, uh, talk then, uh, about your favorite, uh, who is your favorite speaker? Vaughn Roberts. Um, he, uh, spoke at the, um, there, there's a, a service of Holy Eucharist on Friday night at St. Philip's where they, they pull out all the bells and whistles and, yes, you know, you do. have a bagpipe processional to yeah. Highland Cathedral and, um, you know, they bring out the 300 year old silver that, uh, was used um, when uh, I can't remember if it was the Bishop of London or the Archbishop of Canterbury came to celebrate the uh, the 300th anniversary of Charleston. Um, so they have these really weighty, substantive, um, you know, uh, 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 communion um, uh, uh, pieces, and uh, it's just a it, it's just a really fun, high place, and it it really um, it, it's it's a special spot. I will say this. I have some friends who uh, like to snark that ACNA is uh, strip malls and overhead projectors. And while that is is a part of our broader provincial church life, um, sure. apparently they've never been to St. Phillips. <laughs> no, they're not. So, <laughs> I, I'm not uh, going it, to... It's not high church uh, well, in, it, in, in like Anglo-Catholic style. It's... It's high church in Acne style. It's amazing to go to that worship service, and the church. Yeah, it, it, the it last is. time I was I was there last year, and they had somebody. I was just there for a regular Eucharist service, and somebody had an uh, an opera trained voice, who was singing in the mm-hmm. choir, and it was just amazing to hear. And I'm like, oh wow, you know, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah, Jeff. <laughs> it, it was. Um, I'll. I'll I'll try not to gush too much, but needless to say, it, it is a very refreshing thing, and mm-hmm. it, it helps you uh, to, to to come closer to, to feel like you're you're a step closer to worshiping God in spirit and truth. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, obviously that that can take place anywhere, uh, even in our little strip mall storefront with an overhead projector. 
Um, yeah. but, but sometimes you get a little foretaste of heaven and I'm, I'm grateful for the people of St. Philip's church with, with sharing what they have with, with the rest of us. Um, it, it was really life giving. And, um, Von Roberts was a part of that because he provided the, um, the sermon and, um, he had three points for us that I'll just quickly go over. Um, he said, there's a challenge to don't withdraw. Um, and he was talking in the context of uh, Daniel and the Babylonian exile and how um, the, uh, the young men who were brought from Judea uh, learned the Chaldean language, the education, um, and they were not withdrawn from the culture. But as, as many of your viewers have heard, they you know, engaged for the, the, the prosperity of the city yeah. where they were placed. Uh, but at the same time, this, his second point was don't compromise. Um, Daniel didn't defile himself with the king's food. Um, the, uh, there, there are sort of some difficulties on, on one side where um, too many people withdraw, and on the other side, uh, too few uh, maybe withdraw. And, and um, th there is a sort of line of prudential judgment. And um, Daniel knew where to hold the line and where were things that were secondary. Um, so, uh, but he also was somebody who wasn't afraid. And that was what Robert said for the third point, don't be afraid. Um, he said, God gave Daniel favor and compassion, um, especially among people like the chief eunuchs who ran the household. And um, just as God kept Daniel in that moment where Daniel had real reasons to fear, uh, but God kept him and, um, God will also keep his church. So I, I thought that those were just simple things. Obviously as a Protestant, I like those three point outlines, uh, but it was something that, that will stick with me. Don't withdraw, don't compromise and don't be afraid. And, um, in a culture which has a new morality and in which, um, we are challenged by that. Uh, there are some comparisons to the context of Babylon and the people of Judea held in exile there that we can learn from. So I was really grateful for that talk. Um, that one uh, will become available on video. I don't know if it's out yet, uh, but that's one that uh, I really recommend uh, when it becomes available. Maybe we can get it in the show notes and people can put it in yeah, podcast okay. form. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So. Kevin didn't just invite Jeff Walton onto Anglican mm -hmm. Unscripted to talk about stats mm -hmm. or talk about mm -hmm. mere Anglicanism. Uh, there was a, a conflict uh, that happened during the conference that we need to talk about because uh, at one point over the weekend, my Twitter exploded. I guess you can call it X now, but uh, <laughs> and my, 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 my Facebook exploded. Mm -hmm. And then I got a ton of Facebook messages. And I have emails that said, did you hear that Calvin Robinson, one of the speakers at Miriam Clinicism this year, was disinvited after his uh, speech talk? And I said, no, I, I didn't know. And I said, that's, that's odd because I've been to Anglican conferences around the world and listened to Orthodox, listened to Roman Catholic, listened to Lutherans. Uh, preach and teach alongside the Anglicans and never had anybody disinvited. Uh, uh, I even hurt, uh, I'm not going to get into some of the controversial stuff outside of mere Anglicanism, but so I was a little surprised that he was disinvited and I'm like, well, what would he have to do to be disinvited? And I knew you were there and I said, I'm going to uh, ask Jeff to come on the program and give us what you know uh, first of all, uh, tell me the topic of his speech. Yeah, um, the uh, the specific thing that uh, each of the speakers was charged with a, a topic that they would navigate, uh, and this is a, um, uh, I'm sorry, I uh, didn't have the right page open. Um, the, the, the topics basically involve uh, focusing around the, this challenge of the new morality. So Robinson uh, was set to give an address on critical theories. Mm -hmm. And this is something that he is well versed in. Um, some of uh, your viewers are already familiar with his now uh, famous uh, address for the Oxford Union, in yeah. which um, he was in front of a, a not particularly friendly audience. And Hostile. spoke, yeah, and spoke with real 
courage, conviction, and articulated key points that we would want articulated. And that really was one thing that helped put him on the map. And ever since he has built a pretty significant following through social media, um, I was really delighted to meet Calvin in person at GAFCON in Rwanda this past April. And I can report to you, he is just a really neat guy. Um, oh, yes. I, we did, it, I we did an really... interview with him on Unscripted. And yeah. uh, he's a delightful personality. Uh, and, I mean, other than a couple you know, of his convictions, uh, I, I think he, I'm a big fan. I'll, I'll say it right now, I'm a fan of Calvin, Calvin Robinson. Yeah, this is a guy who, I mean, I'm not anybody special in particular, and uh, I got to sit down with him and some um, uh, friendly Anglo-Catholic clergy folks at GAFCON and just talked for probably about 40 minutes. And that was just really very kind of him and the other men. Um, that's not something I often get in Washington, D.C. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for that. And he's been been, been kind to me ever since. And I'm glad that we got to connect at this conference. Uh, to just give that as, as context. Um, so one of the things that Calvin sought to navigate, and by the way, I'll tell you this, uh, he has gone ahead and published on his Substack, uh, which people can access the text of his address. Uh, so that is available. And then, as I've said before, at some point, the, the conference will make available all the conference speakers' presentations mm -hmm. in video form, uh, although I don't have a, a, a date for when that will occur. Um, but one of the things he was talking about is what is critical theory and what are its root causes? And he didn't waste a lot of time. He, he basically said go, that feminism is the brute force that breaks down the wall so that all these other critical uh, theory ideologies can come through the door. And um, that uh, has to do with stuff about um, feminism has to do with uh, smashing the patriarchy, destroying heteronormativity. And uh, that a lot of that has ushered in uh, something that you and I have heard a term for cultural Marxism. Oh, sure. So uh, this is something he talked about. Now, I'm going to do a quick aside really quick uh, from my own end. I think we have to be careful with our use of the term Marxism, because just as people on the left who I disagree with often go and say, everyone I don't agree with on the Internet is Hitler, uh, those of us who are on the more conservative side of the spectrum can fall into that trap and say, everything I don't agree with on the Internet is Marx. So sure. we have to be careful with that. Uh, but that is not what Calvin was doing here. He was trying to explain what Marx had done, his qualms with God himself, and that there was a, a pathway that was spearheaded in his viewpoint by feminism that was then allowing these other critical theories to come in. And that's sort of what we've been, been dealing with in our society ever since. Um, it was, however, uh, very controversial as well, because um, as you, everyone here knows, because they chose to click on this video, um, issues of holy orders are extremely controversial in uh, our, our part of the Church Universal. And sure. um, this is something that uh, Calvin has strength of his convictions, and he is willing to say flatly what he believes without dancing around it with the, the nuance forever that I'm known for. Um, so uh, he said that liberalism is idolatry of the self and that it is disguised as freedom and that and this is a quote from him. Liberalism is sin. Um, that was a really tough one for me to hear. Um, while Calvin did not use the term classical liberal, um, what he was describing would have fit the description of classical liberalism, not simply neoliberalism. Uh, I consider myself a classical liberal. Uh, I believe in concepts like consent of the governed, ordered liberty, things that are rooted in the Enlightenment and in figures like John Locke and um, some, some other figures that built on that and, of course, were uh, influential in our thinking of our own founders here in the United States. Yeah, it's good. Um, you know. Uh, this is something that um, he was he was he was very insistent upon this though, 
And I, where we're going to have to, I'm going to have to probably sit down with Calvin and, and flesh out more. Okay, what's the distinction here between classical liberalism and neoliberalism? And where do you think things went off the rail? The reason I think that he's speaking in the context of classical liberalism, even though he didn't use the word classical, is because he brought a lot of this back to Martin Luther and talked about what happened in the Reformation and the basically some of, again, some of these walls that Luther broke down. And uh, you'll be able to see this in, in, in the sub stack if, if you choose to go, which we can put in the show notes. But um, basically, the gist of it is, is that Luther kind of opened a door and that Marx then seized upon that in his response to Hegel, the, uh, uh, the German philosopher, and then uh, basically shunted this stuff through um, sort of you're divorcing the Western culture and um, from, from its, its sort of life-giving roots um, in, in, in classicism and in uh, early Christian teaching. So um, I'm a big fan of Martin Luther. That does not mean that Luther is above criticism. Uh, no, there absolutely. were some pretty significant problems. Uh, let's acknowledge the fact that Luther died an anti-Semite. So, uh, yeah, that's a problem. Um, but uh, that that there are some pretty amazing things that are made possible, including the fact that we were able to do our church service on Friday night in English. And um, that is, you know, one of Luther's one of the people that contributed to and made worship in the vernacular possible. Um I, I also have really personally benefited from Lutheran teaching hymns. Uh, my, own, my own parents spent time in the Missouri Synod, and uh, we had some pretty good discussions with them about um, Luther's small catechism and the Book of Concord. Uh, that, so I, I really want to be careful because there's a, there's a real danger here of saying that there's a direct line between Martin Luther and Drag Queen Story Hour. And that once you got on board with the Reformation, you're you're at Drag Queen Story Hour, and I don't think that that's true. Um, no. People are more complicated yeah. with that, um, but there is a uh, Luther. I think really matters, and uh, this is something that Jeff Miller, who is the conference convener and the rector of St. Philip's, addressed immediately following Calvin's talk. He would get up after a speaker, give a brief announcement, maybe a thought. And in this case, he he executed one of the most deft, uh, just incredible uh, wrappings of the bow that I've ever seen. When he, 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 could, he knew, obviously, that uh, some people were, were very off-putted <clears throat> by some of the, um, the, the substantial nature and the, 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 uh, the, 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 the statements that were very clear-cut that uh robinson made and he said uh to everybody well you know i want to make a uh, share a story about when my wife and i went to uh germany and uh, it turned out we had an ancestor who was a direct were a direct descendant of uh martin luther and um talked about going and, and seeing the table where luther wrote his famous table talks and um you know, one of the things he, he shared was about how when Luther got up to speak at the um, the Diet of Worms, that uh, he had this, this appeal to, to conviction and conscience. And what uh, Miller shared with each of us in the audience was, even though we may be in significant disagreement with um, Robinson on some of these issues, that we can see and acknowledge that he was speaking conviction according to his conscience. And I think people responded well to that, even though they didn't necessarily uh, all agree with the elements of Robinson's talk. Um, you know, different speakers had different responses, uh, all pretty positive. Um, the conclusion of Robinson's talk was mostly polite applause. Uh, a few people stood up and applauded and aggressively applauded in full affirmation of what they heard. And I also heard loud audible booing from parts of the music hall. So oh. there were different people who had uh, different responses to this. And I think Miller was, was really trying to meet the, the audience where they're at. And of course, assure them that there was space for this and that there would be different uh, voices heard uh, across the subsequent sessions that would not all be in agreement. 
Um, okay, so, so that was, that was he, yeah. there was an indication then after his talk that okay, there's space for this. We, there's um, we, mere Anglicanism is about teaching classical Anglicanism mm -hmm. and about seeking the truth, and yeah. so here it is. Hmm. Yeah, and this is a it's a the other thing he said too that really I thought captured it well as he said, when iron sharpens iron, sparks are going to fly. And that's something that I really need to hear. Uh, as I've shared with you before, I'm a conflict averse person, uh, an interpersonal conflict, which may be the most hilarious irony ever because I work at the Institute on Religion and Democracy. Yes. But um, uh, yeah, I, I struggle with people being angry with me and being upset. And uh, some of my friends don't struggle with that. They are okay with getting into the fight and they make those sparks fly. And <clears throat> I, I think I think Calvin is one of those people who who is okay with making the sparks fly uh, as part of that, you know, iron sharpening iron. So uh, that that's a that's a big thing. But there, there's a there's a context here though too that has to do with the course holy orders, as I mentioned already, and most of the internet blow up that you described didn't have to do with Martin Luther. It didn't have to do with classical liberalism. It had to do with holy orders. And uh, there are many people in that room who have very different viewpoints on what the priesthood is, let alone who is qualified to be a priest. Um, so uh, the next, well, First of all, the rest of the day went really well, I thought. Uh, Jeff Miller had done such a good job at tying that bow that um, everybody seemed to be okay and stuff was fine. Um, and we had the wonderful worship service that night. Uh, and then the next morning, I got there and, and one of my fellow attendees said, oh, did you see what happened? You know, uh, I said, no, what? And he said, oh, oh, Calvin Robinson was disinvited from the conference. And I'm like, really? He seemed to be pretty good spirits what? last night. <laughs> I was like, I, I talked to you last night, everything seemed to be good. Um, but, um, and of course, many others did as well. And uh, uh, Calvin uh, had announced that he had been summoned in and had, had been asked uh, not to participate in panel discussion at the conclusion of the conference. Uh, there were eight different speakers. Uh, five of them were going to take part in the panel discussion. Uh, and he was going to originally be one of those five. Um, so there, at the end of the conference, there was the panel discussion. Um, he was there and I had the opportunity to speak with him afterwards, as did many others, but, um, uh, th th there was an empty chair and that was not addressed from the, the stage. So, um, what we have at this point is a an account from Calvin, which, um, has been published on a Substack. Uh, explaining uh, what happened and uh, his viewpoint on it. Um, and then we have accounts of people like me who were there at the conference, but seeing things from, you know, the chairs out front, not from the behind the scenes. We have not heard yet from the conference organizers about this, and they did not address it from the stage, which kind of I understand because uh, this did not play out on the stage, so it wasn't necessarily necessary incumbent upon them to address it on the stage. Um, I have been to other conferences where there have been uh, some pretty tumultuous things that have happened. Uh, I'll rattle off for them really quickly. Uh, there was one at GAFCON uh, in which, um, uh, well, you might remember the whole Tito Zavala thing. Uh, I do where remember. The, yeah, uh, so yeah. there's that. Uh, there, and there was a lot of concern about the way that was presented and, and uh, I, I know that was that was controversial um, and uh, even at New Wineskins which is uh, another favorite conference um, they had a speaker last time who uh, basically said that theological <laughs> education hinders uh, missionary activity uh, that was not entirely well received <laughs> and, and well, they, the speaker we look back at we look back at that now we kind of laugh and we're like oh that was kind of a disaster but you know, everybody got over it and it wasn't like the end of the world. So it, the reality is sometimes you just have to trust your audience and know that they can take these things in and navigate. And we've all been there before. And we might be looking back at this three years and be like, oh, remember that Calvin Robinson hubbub? So I want to just place it in that context and say, <laughs> we're not the first. And remember, no, you're remember not the, the first. time? Yeah. Well, I was going to say. It, it, 
yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. At New Line Skin, you and I and many others talked about the main speaker uh, for the first night who, it, at best I say, conflated his numbers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, he uh, claimed that he was responsible for converting an entire country in sub-Saharan Africa from Islam to Christianity, which um, uh, we, we were all looking at each other like, what is this country? Um, there was some braggadocio there that was um, yeah. uh, uh, very cartoonish. Cartoonish, but it, it caused a seminary to send a letter to New Wine uh, to you know clear it all up. But And so this is the first time. <laughs> There's been people, who, you know, I, okay, so we've covered it. You know, ACNA or the ACNA, uh, the Episcopal Church, every church has run into having a speaker where they're like, oh boy. And here's that old boy moment. Now, uh, I don't see, I don't get to the point where you're disinviting them, though, or you don't want to have them at, at the panel com- uh, conversation at the end because, uh, as the College of Bishops themselves said, this is still an open issue. We, they have, they've come to a decision that this they can't make a decision, is what on women's orders, and uh, you know, it, I'll read you one line from their uh, uh, statement they put out a couple years ago. I think it was 2017. Um, we are, we have not effectively disciplined. Let's go down here. Fulfilled. What do I want to read out here? Okay, however, we acknowledge that this practice is, and talk about women's orders, is a recent innovation to the uh, uh, traditions in Catholic order. We agree that there is insufficient scriptural warrant to accept women's ordination to the priesthood as a standard practice throughout the province. However, we continue to acknowledge that individual dioceses have constitutional authority to ordain women to the priesthood. There is a conflict within the ACNA still. Mm-hmm. And is Calvin Robinson exposing that conflict? Or did he overstep that bounds by uh, not having uh, disregard for the audience? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I've been told that um, as part of the preparation for this conference, that uh, guidance was given. Uh, two speakers, and there was some information exchanged, partially to make sure that um, uh, speakers weren't completely stepping on each other's toes, and which is just a pragmatic thing, uh, yeah. and also to kind of to kind of get them into the lane to speak about the part that needs to be spoken about. And um, Calvin has shared that uh, the night before uh, he was set to speak, he did feel convicted to to change his address uh so he went back and worked through it some more and developed some more points uh i'm not saying that he had ever shown his address to the conference organizers i don't think it's at that level but but um as it was relayed by calvin the the conference organizers felt that he had significantly deviated from uh the lane of critical theory that he had been given um I do think that he addressed critical theory uh, pretty extensively. Um, the, the, the issue was he didn't really get into critical race theory. He started largely with, with feminism, and uh, that was the focal point, the locus that, that, that things really started with. Um, this, is, this continues to be a really dicey topic throughout our, our province, and... Um, it is not going away anytime soon. Um, and people who I really respect have very different viewpoints uh, from one another. Mm-hmm. Um, the one comment that always sticks with me about this was um, Bishop Keith Ackerman several years ago, who's an assistant uh, down in, in Texas, used to be uh, Bishop of Quincy. Uh, you know, Quincy was one of the dioceses in the Episcopal Church that did not ordain women uh, to, the, um, to, to the priesthood. And he was talking about the difference between speaking in the Episcopal Church's House of Bishops and speaking in the ACNA College of Bishops. And he said, you know, we still have disagreements, but, and I'm paraphrasing here, but one of the things that he said, for the first time in my life, I feel like I'm being heard. That's right. What's happening is uh, people are not coming to the same conclusions as I am, but they are listening to me and they can relay my argumentation without caricature. 
And he said, you know, that that was something that he really wanted. And uh, I took that as, as an affirmation of ACNA. And it's like, okay, we're not all coming to the same conclusions, but there, there is at least a good spirit in which we are receiving other people's argumentation. So th- that, that's part of what's going on here is people are saying, hey, or Calvin himself used the word and said, I was canceled from this conference. Well, I don't know if I would use that term. Uh, it depends how you define cancellation. The conference wasn't kicking him out. They weren't saying you're dead to me. Uh, they were simply, they'd given him the microphone and for the next session, they declined to extend the microphone to him again. That is their prerogative as the conveners of the conference. Um, they are, uh, to quote Ronald Reagan, uh, Mr. Speaker, I am paying for this microphone. Um, so they get, um, <laughs> sorry, kids, that really dates me. Uh, but, um, it does. That, is, <laughs> that, is, that was, bef- that was before he was president. That's when he was running for governor. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was, it, it, no, no, it wasn't that long ago. That was because he was governor in the sixties. Uh, yeah. Reagan was, uh, I was from, I thought it was a New Hampshire thing. Uh, but, um, uh, pe- people in the comments, correct us for that. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to get a whole download there for people. Um, the, yeah. uh, so yeah, I mean, they, they, there's a, just to try to circle this back. Um, uh, I want to defer to the conference organizers to provide boundaries to make sure the conference is about a specific theme, and not have it spiral off into other directions. But at the same time, the sensitivity of this and the disagreement that we had within the room. Uh, another participant talked about um, kind of being able to feel uh, kind of a visceral reaction as some of these things were were being said from the stage. Um, you know, th- th- this is th- this is a sore point for us, and it's going to continue to be. But I I really hope that as we seek to navigate this in good faith, that we will be good listeners to others and we will be able to relay their comments and their relay their argumentation without caricature as um, Bishop Ackerman had, had, had shared. Um, So, so that is uh, I I will, I'll try to keep in my lane and, and, and and leave it at that. But um, that, that, that is one of the, the concerns is, is, is what is cancellation? Um, Is there a responsibility of, those who can be in the conference to to keep things on the rails and uh and other thing too is um um john dixon from wheaton uh did share over twitter publicly uh he said you know calvin was not kicked out of the conference uh he was paid uh the full honoraria that he was um expected to uh and, and you know that this is probably not the um you know that there were everything seemed to be fine behind the stage. There are probably things here that I don't have full information on because I wasn't behind the stage. So I will just leave it at that. Well, I, and I invite your Anglicanism to come on if they want to talk about uh, what happened or or even Calvin Robinson. Uh, I would have asked Calvin, but last time I, I scheduled him, it took two months to get him on the show. And I, I know he's flying (laughs) back to England. I didn't, I didn't want to, to call him. I wanted an eyewitness to give both sides of the story. Jeff, you did a great, a great job doing that. What is the follow-up now on, on social media? What are people saying? What, what, what do you, what's the turmoil going on? Well, I, my, uh, not only social media blew up, but I got a lot of text messages from people. Um, so they knew I was here and they wanted to know what the story was. So this has gotten around. Um, I can tell you that the, the, the tweet I did uh, of Calvin's um, Friday morning presentation, uh, noting the, the objections to liberalism, the, the, the critique with Luther, and the, the, the women's ordination grenade being rolled down the aisle, uh, that that was, um, that tweet is spread farther than any tweet I've ever done. Um, I mean, I probably tweet maybe 150, maybe 500 people see it if it's a good tweet. Uh, this was over 50,000. So, um, and that was just one little tweet. So, well, can, um, can you tweet this episode when you get a chance? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure if we put Calvin's name in it, it'll get more viewership. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it is, it is, but that shows you that there is an intense interest and reaction. Um, I, uh, uh, it, it, the other thing too is, you know, 
Mirror Anglicanism always sells out, as I said. It's mm -hmm. it's always been a high profile conference. Even uh, for those who are old enough to remember, it used to be called uh, <laughs> Scholarly Engagement with Anglican Doctrine, which sounds like yeah. Um, yeah. some sort of medicine to help you with insomnia. Uh, but um, that uh, that grew and was well stewarded into this accessible scholarly conference for uh, lay people like me to be able to, to hear from. Uh, so um, I think it will, will continue to be successful and will grow, but um, uh, this is, this will be a, uh, this will be something that will be remembered for a while. <laughs> Thanks to Anglican on Scripture, I suppose. All right, well, I want to thank you for your time, and you, you did a great job uh, uh, bringing us up to speed on the topic and what happened, and uh, I hope that we can uh, uh, help clarify what really happened. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Jeff Walton. And you've been watching episode 839 of Anglican Unscripted.